Hey guys, Joe from Eastwood. You've seen me TIG weld before. I've shot a video with the TIG 200 ACDC, and you guys probably know I'm by no means an expert. I don't TIG weld every day. So today I'm gonna get a lesson from a pro. Joining me is Cody Baramani. He's a product manager here at Eastwood. And if you have a question about TIG welding, this is the guy you're gonna go to. And he's gonna run me through it from A to Z, what goes into TIG welding, and he's gonna give me all the tips and tricks that he has along the way. So Cody, thank you so much for joining me. Yep. Before we dive in here, we got a lot of stuff on the table, so what do we start with? Well, Joe, the first thing we wanna get started with is safety. The first thing you're gonna absolutely need when you're doing any welding process is a welding helmet. What we have on the table here is our XL 9300, welding helmet. It's our largest non-panoramic helmet. Really nice, really versatile, but we carry a wide variety of welding helmets here for just about any price point. Mm. Next, you're going to need a good set of welding gloves. Now, we have TIG welding gloves here. They're really thin, and they give you a lot of dexterity. I was going to say, compared to MIG gloves, these look a lot thinner. And that's a big help when you're getting started TIG welding. You can feel the filler rod a lot better. You can feel the TIG torch, and you need a lot of that it's kind of fine motor movement when you're TIG welding. That feel, right? Yes. Yeah, right. you're not going to need that as much when you're doing MIG welding, and even less so with stick welding. And with stick welding, MIG welding, you're going to have a lot more heat, and you need to protect your hands a lot better. Okay. So the last thing you're going to need is a jacket. That welding jacket, it's going to save you from all the UV and IR rays, keep you safe. Skin damage, it's serious stuff. It's a serious hazard when you're welding. You want to be protected. Yeah, I've seen the, the TIG welder suntan sort of around the neck here, at the top of the gloves, up the forearm, and you definitely don't want that. And that's the short-term result, but there's also some long-term health consequences that you want to be aware of and stay safe from. Also, how about the environment, Cody? What don't you want in the garage while you're doing TIG welding? So when you're welding with any process, you need a clean area. You don't want to have any oily rags, any sawdust. You know, you don't want to do it in a woodworking shop. You don't want to do it in a barn right. or anything like that. You got to have an environment that's safe from any fire hazards because you're going to throw sparks. There's going to be hot metal. There's going to be, you know, potential hazards involved with that. Additionally, when you're TIG welding, you really want to do it indoors in an area that you know, doesn't have a lot of wind blowing through it or anything like that. This is a really kind of precise process and you need a clean, safe environment to do it in. Gotcha. So the other stuff we have on the table here as well, it looks like we got some straightened out coat hanger from, from what I could see. Not quite, Joe. So you're gonna need some additional supplies to complete your TIG 200 ACDC or any TIG welder you get to get actually started in welding. You're gonna need some filler metal, you're gonna need some additional tungstens, and you're gonna need a way to sharpen and prepare your tungsten. So what we've got here, this is all available at eastwood.com. It's all Eastwood stuff, great quality, great price. So our filler metal here, this is ER70 S-2. So that's for your mild steels. This is just really good, really easy to work with, and it's gonna be perfect with our 14 gauge mild steel. Okay, so you'd be using this stuff for most automotive processes probably, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. When you're doing automotive restoration, this is what you're gonna use. And we have 1 16th here and 3 30 seconds. Okay. We also carry 0.045. That's gonna be great for thin sheet metal, doing some, say, body repair. But these are gonna be your two most popular sizes. We're gonna use the 1 16th, working with that 14 gauge. Okay. Now with tungstens, we have the multi-mix tungstens. What that means is that you can weld both steel and aluminum. Super versatile product, and when you're a beginner, it's great. You don't have to worry about picking the right tungsten for the right material. It's universal. It's going to give you great results in either way. Right, so something like that would pair great with the TIG 200 AC DC, right? Exactly, yep. Now you're not switching back and forth. It's great for a digital TIG. It's also great for a straight DC TIG. It's just a good all-around product. You don't have to worry about, man, do I have the right tungsten for this metal. Additionally, we have two sizes here. So we've got a 1 16th and a 3 30 second. The 1 16th is what we're gonna use for this 14 gauge steel. Now, if you're welding over eighth inch, that's when you can start to think about using the 3 30 second tungsten. It's gonna handle the heat better, and it's just gonna give you a little bit better weld at that higher amp. Okay, and, and what's this guy right here? So that's our TG1800 tungsten grinder. This is what you're gonna use to prepare your tungsten. It's got a couple different angles and a couple different sizes to allow you to work both 1 16th and 3 30 seconds tungsten down to a 10 degree or 22 and a half degree angle. That sharpened tungsten is gonna give you a really precise arc. Gotcha. 
Now, I've been guilty of this in the past. I've used a belt sander to sharpen my tungsten, and I've since switched to this, but just to go over why you would want something like this, what makes the tungsten grinder better than this belt sander? So traditionally, you would have had to dedicate your own grinding wheel to grinding tungsten. You need a wheel that's clean, that you're not putting impurities, contaminants into. Right. Having a tungsten grinder like this, it's its own dedicated tool, but it doesn't take up space in your shop. It's small, you can take it with you where you're going to weld, and with that diamond wheel on it, it's gonna last a long time, and it's not gonna contaminate your tungsten. Like an aluminum oxide wheel, it could certainly contaminate, and that aluminum oxide wheel, it could also hold steel, aluminum, what you used on the last project. You know, by having a dedicated tool for preparing your tungsten, you're not gonna set off on the wrong foot. You know, you're gonna get the best result possible. All right, so we have everything cleared off and now we just have our TIG 200 ACDC on the table. We have everything we need. We need to get this thing set up. Now, this thing is pretty easy to set up, even for a beginner like me, but Cody, why don't you walk us through exactly what goes into that? So like you said, Joe, this is our new TIG 200 ACDC. Really easy to set up, but it's good for both the DIY beginner and the professional. Got a lot of great features in this machine. Super simple layout. Let's walk through it. So since we're welding steel, we're not gonna worry about the AC side of this machine. We're not gonna worry about balance or anything like that. So that makes it even easier to set up. So we have amperage, pre-flow, and post-flow. That's all we're gonna worry about. We're not gonna worry about the clearance effect or balance. That's for aluminum specifically. That's correct, right. yep. And that's, that's what's gonna affect the amount of time that the welder spends electrode negative or electrode Versus positive. positive. So we're gonna set the machine to DC. That's what you're gonna use with all of your steel welding, both steel and stainless steel. We're gonna set the machine to foot pedal. That's gonna give you all the control you need for doing that longer weld that we're gonna practice with. It's good to practice with the foot pedal because that allows you to control that heat and kind of fine tune with what you're seeing as you're welding. Right, now the other option would be the control on the torch itself. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but 95% of the time, you're gonna be using the foot pedal. In which situations would you use that torch trigger? So, the torch trigger is great if you're gonna do a short, repetitive weld. You're gonna be on steel. You're not gonna have to adjust your amperage. It lets you get to that set amperage and get off. Real quick, real easy. It's also great in tight spots. You know, you may be welding under the car. Can't really use a foot pedal when you're laying down. True. Now, the foot pedal, you're gonna be using it definitively when you're welding aluminum because you're gonna need that ability to control your amperage and really control your heat. Right, and tail off at the end of the... Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we'll keep it set in foot pedal, and then we're going to be in TIG mode. Now this TIG 200 ACDC, it's also a stick welder. You get yourself a stick electrode holder, some stick rod, you can get the job done if you need to. That's great if you're out in the field, windy area, ran out of shielding gas, still got to get a project done. It's just good to have that option of versatility. Totally different process. You know, again today, talking about TIG, so let's set it in TIG. Well, we've got our welder all set up in the right mode we want. You know, DC TIG, gonna use the foot pedal. Let's check out the setup chart. This setup chart is crucial for a beginner because we've laid it all out to make it really easy to get the machine dialed in at a good starting point for what material you're welding, what thickness you're welding. It's really easy. Yeah, so, this is pretty much everything you need up here, right? Tungsten diameter, filler, what kind of filler rod you need, pre and post, torch cup size, pretty much everything is right here. Exactly, exactly. So we're gonna look at 330 seconds thick steel. Mm -hmm. It's really easy in there. You know, we got DC negative, 75 to 125 amp. We're gonna use 1 16th electrode, like what we talked about earlier. You know, we've got 0.4 second pre-flow, five second post-flow, real straightforward. That's a very good starting point. And the only thing we're gonna tweak from there is that amperage, you know, we're gonna run right around the middle there, 100 amps. So based on the chart there, we're gonna set the machine up right at 100 amps. We're gonna go with 0.4 seconds pre-flow, five seconds post-flow. Now, pre-flow is the gas flowing out of the nozzle before the arc initiates, right? Exactly, exactly. When you come down on that foot pedal, you're gonna hear 0.4 seconds of gas, then you're gonna hear the high-frequency start kick on, that's gonna initiate your arc, you'll begin your weld. 
and that keeps the weld in that little tiny atmosphere, so it's nice and uncontaminated. Exactly. Same thing goes with post flow on the other side, right? A little exactly. longer, but yep. the same idea. Yep, yeah, it's creating an inert environment to prevent any porosity or contamination at the beginning of the weld. And then at the end of the weld, it's also providing a little bit of a cooling effect in addition to that inert environment. All right, Joe, got the machine set up. Let's get into some welding. All right, let's get down to it. We got a couple lap joints, a couple butt joints. Exactly. Let's weld them up. So we've got our metal. It's all cleaned up, ready to go. Let's talk technique, Joe. So the first thing we're going to talk about is torch position. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got our lap weld here. We're going to want our torch to be about an eighth inch or less away from the material, but you never want to touch the material. That's going to contaminate your tungsten. We're going to want to be about 15 to 20 degrees pointed in the direction of travel, and we're going to want to point right into the intersection of the two pieces of material. So that means, you know, in this lap weld, we're going to want to get right where they touch each other, right. down in that root. Right. On a butt weld like this, we're going to want to be pointed perpendicular and right into that intersection. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. So as you go and you travel, maintaining that position and gap, you're going to then watch your heat. If it looks like it's starting to spread out and get too hot, you're going to back off on the amperage mm -hmm. or you're going to increase your travel speed. If it looks like it's getting really cold, it's not melting together correctly, that's where you're going to want to slow down or increase your amperage. And you can do both because we're in foot pedal setting. Gotcha. So now it really gives you some flexibility to get that weld dialed in. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to do this weld first as a fusion weld. That means we're not going to use any filler rod. We're just going to rely on melting the two pieces of metal together for a or fusion, and that's still pretty strong weld. After you do that, we're then going to practice with adding filler material. That makes it a little easier to get started, understand your torch position, understand your heat, and now you can go back and learn how to feed the wire correctly. Gotcha. Well, let's do it. Okay. Let's try it. Here, why don't you do a dry run like we were talking about? Now, don't do forget, it. that torch head, it's a flex head, so you can right, adjust so you it can to get really the angle you want. Move that around. Yep. To yeah, I know. Get perfectly into that joint. Being left handed, I was kind of showing moving this way. Now, with you being right handed, you're probably going to want to move this way. You okay. Know, do what feels right, comfortable right, right. for you. Okay, so. That looks good. I'm nice and close. Yep, I'm you straight, got some torch angle. Just a little bit of angle, 15 to 20 degrees over. In that direction. Straight travel. into the joint. And I'm just going to move along. Yep. At a nice pace. Yep. Steady. You're going to. Like a surgeon. Exactly. Exactly, that looks real good. That looks real good. Cool, I think I got it. Cool. Let's give it a shot. All right, let's get suited up. Should be good to go. Cool. Looking good, looking good. Now, if you want, you can back up a little in that travel angle, you know, kind of get a little more perpendicular, but you're not doing bad, not bad. You can watch that heat. Looking good. All right, Joe, keep that torch down there. That's going to help your shielding gas, keep everything cool. All right. Check it out. Cool. Not bad, man. What do you think? Not bad at all. Thank you. So you got a really good start. You kept real consistent with where you were relative from the top and bottom panel. Mm -hmm. You can tell that because it's you know nice and even there. You can see you have a little area here. Now you had a little bit of a hiccup where things kind of keyholed. You moved a little too quick. You didn't get a complete weld there. That's okay. Now, if you had to, you could come back, wash that in. That would be okay. Now, as you got the hang of it, you got good travel here. Everything looks good, like you had nice penetration and a little bit of undercut there. Mm -hmm. Now, that's going to happen with the fusion weld like this. 
what we're right. going to do next, we're going to add some filler material, teach you how to do that as you progress through the weld. You're going to have a great weld at the end. You know. Yeah, as far as that dip, I mean, the metal has to come from somewhere, and it's these two pieces. So once we add in, it'll give you that nice sort of bead. All right, Joe, you ready to try feeding some filler rod? Absolutely. Give another shot? Absolutely. All right, let's get set up here. So now one quick tech tip. When you get your filler rod out of your holder, this is something Mark taught me years ago. If you don't fold the end over, you're kind of wielding a serious poking <laughs> object. You know, you right. got a big hazard. Right. So just bend the end. That keeps everything safe. You know, when you're welding, you got your helmet down, you don't know where the other end of that filler rod right. is. Just a quick tech tip, really helpful. So as we've talked through, you know, with your fusion weld, you had your torch angle, you had your travel angle down, your travel speed down. Mm. You know, you did a great job there. Now we're going to talk about adding the filler rod and the way to feed it, you have your index and middle finger, you let it sit kind of between your thumb and your index finger there, and now you can pinch between the two fingers, progress, and you can even go backwards if you have to. Hmm. So one thing that's really helpful, you know, sit around, take five, 10 minutes, just practice this at home. You don't have feeding, to be welding, feeding. you can do it in front of the TV, right. do it, you know, whenever you have a free couple minutes, and it definitely helps get in the hang of it. Right. Feel good? A little wavy on the end, but yep. maybe... Uh... Now, again, when you're just starting out as well, you can give yourself a little bit extra there and work in small sections. You know, don't feel like you have to do this whole thing in one shot. Mm. Take small bites, you'll yeah. get the project Pause, done. then yep. feed yep. a nice big chunk. And if you get stuck here and it's like, man, I'm out of filler rod, got to get a little bit more. You can remember, back off the amperage on the foot pedal. You can sit there for a couple seconds while you get the filler rise you need. Gotcha. Then get going. Okay. Okay? So, again, we're going to have that same torch angle, same travel speed that you had. Now you're just going to move, dip, move, dip, move, dip. Feel good? I mean, do you think you get the mechanics of it? Yeah, I think it's now, just... It's one extra layer of complexity yes. to add into something that's already decently complex, but, <laughs> but that's what really makes the, uh, the money with TIG welding, isn't it? Now, one thing too, you wanna keep that filler metal in kind of the inert environment. So you wanna keep it close to that gas lens at all times. That's gonna keep it clean. It's gonna keep it hot, ready to go. So that way when you dip it in, you're not going to have any contamination or you have to worry about heating up. Okay. So keep it close. Don't, don't come back here to then feed your rod. Gotcha. And what edge of the puddle do you dip in? Do you just dip it right? Do you aim for the middle? Do you slide it in from the edge sort of? I kind of come in at the leading edge there, you know, and I'm not going to lay the rod in. I'm going to come in at a little bit of an angle. So if, if my torch is like this and my filler rod's like that. You make that nice V yes. sort of. Yep. Okay. I know I'm going to come in, keep moving. Cool. Let's give it a shot. Okay. So far, so good, Joe. Nice and consistent. Looking good. Looking real good. All right, Joe, hey, why, why don't we stop? Okay. We got a little bit of an issue here, just there, where your travel speed, you know, you slowed down a little bit, but then it also got a little cold. So then you kind of, I saw you sort of tried to fill it back in there. Yeah. We still got a little undercut there. Now what you started, these first couple are perfect. Yeah, I, you I felt really awesome strong job. up at the front. Awesome job there, and I think, you know, it's just getting that movement right. You were probably really comfortable with your position there. Right. And then as you tried to slide along, things got a little shakier. Okay. So, so slide great. along, yep. keep the power yep. up a little bit as we slide and uh, continue on. Yes, yeah. Cool. Let's, let's keep going, see if I can make an improvement. Yeah, let's cool. give it another shot. Nice work.
So you're moving a little too far between each of them. Okay. Come in a little closer. There you go. And maybe try and get just a little. Yep, that's a good one. Nice work. All right, Joe. All right, so I know you have some feedback for me, Cody. Looks like there's a few different things going on here. Tell me what you think. Real good, Joe, real good job. So you can see here, this is where you pick back up with the second go around. You got nice coverage there, no undercut, moving along really good. Still got to work a little bit on that consistent feed speed. Mm -hmm. You know, not quite as good as what you had there in the little, the beginning, but still that's, that's good. That's a real good job for just, you know, picking it up today, Shooting a not having much experience yeah. at all. Not bad. And again, I mean, with TIG welding, practice makes perfect. I mean, practice is everything. So you just repeat those steps, you know, do that welding without the filler rod, work on the fusion weld. That's mm -hmm. going to help you with that consistent travel speed, your torch angle, right. torch space from the workpiece. Then come in, add filler rod, again, do the exercise of feeding right. the filler rod without welding. You're going to be TIG welder in no time. Well, thank you, man. I really do appreciate nice that. Work. But that's really it. The thing about TIG welding is there's a lot that goes into this. I feel like I have all the steps individually, but this is mastery at the end of the day, right? Some yes. people make their whole careers off of this skill, so it takes a long time to really build up to that. But as far as the basics go, how'd I do? Not bad at all. I mean, it's great. pretty straightforward. I think you did a great job. TIG 200 ACDC, again, a great machine, easy to set up, easy for a beginner, get the hang of it, try it out, as well as for the professional to jump in, it's going to be, again, quick and easy to set up, and he's going to have it dialed in just the way he likes it. So for more information on the TIG 200 ACDC or any of the Eastwood products you sell here today, visit eastwood.com.